Twice recently, I've been asked about the differences between continuity testing and insulation resistance testing. It was then that I realised that whilst old hands just know the difference, there are still many new starters in the trade for whom this is a big question. So, in this video, we will look at answering the question. The question that was asked was, why do we test a copper conductor for continuity and expect a low ohms reading about 1 or 2 ohms? And then, why do we test the same conductor at 500 volts and expect the reading in millions of ohms? What has changed? Why are the tests different if this is still the same piece of copper conductor? The simple answer is that we are actually carrying out two different tests. We first do a continuity test and then an insulation resistance test. So what is the difference? What is a continuity test and what is an insulation resistance test? Why are the two test voltages different and why do we want different test results? When continuity testing, we are testing that the copper conductor is continuous from one end to the other. It tests the resistance value, the ohms value of the copper. Each size or cross-sectional area of copper conductor will have a standard reference value in milliohms per metre. If we know the length, we can calculate the expected ohms value and make a comparison. If we know the ohms value, we can calculate the length. The insulation resistance test is different. It will confirm that the plastic insulation around the conductor is unbroken and undamaged and that it is fit for purpose and will not let electrical current leak out of the cable. We are testing the plastic, but we need to put the test voltage through the copper conductor since the plastic insulation will not conduct the electrical test current. We use a higher voltage, typically 500 volts, for the test on the assumption that if the plastic insulation does not leak or break down at 500 volts, then it should be OK at the normal everyday voltage of 230 volts. So a quick recap on the two tests before we delve a little deeper. The continuity test is checking the copper conductor with a test voltage of around 4 volts. The result expected is a low ohms result and depending on the cable size and length it is perhaps just 1 or 2 ohms of resistance and certainly less than 5 ohms for a domestic property. And knowing what values to expect will become familiar to you and easy to remember with practice. The insulation resistance test will verify that the plastic insulation is intact, no holes or cracks, etc. The test voltage is typically 500 volts and this test voltage goes into the copper conductor, not the plastic insulation, since the insulation is non-conductive. The result expected is in the very high ohms range, above 1 megohm or 1 million ohms, and often above 200 megohms or more, especially for new cables. We can look at continuity testing in a little more detail now. Remember that with this test, the lower the resistance reading, the better. If we set our test meter to low ohms and test the cables shown here from A to B, we might get a resistance reading of just one ohm showing on the meter. If we choose a bigger size conductor, say twice the cross-sectional area, we find that the resistance value reduces as it is easier for current to flow. Thicker copper allows more current to flow and Ohm's law tells us that this must equate to a lower resistance. And shown here, it has reduced to half an ohm. However, if we make the cable twice as long, the resistance will increase. It will double in value as there is now a longer length and it is harder for the current to flow through it. And then, there is the temperature to consider. Copper will change resistance slightly as the temperature changes. A conductor measured at room temperature will increase in resistance value as the temperature rises. With copper conductors, we have a limiting temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, and we always try to keep the temperature below this. There are many problems that we might have with continuity tests, and knowing what they are will help with your testing and fault finding. A good cable, with no fault, and with an intact conductor, might measure just one ohm, as shown at the top. Compare this to the lower drawing, where the copper has a break in it. It is said to be open circuit, and it is usually not possible to prove this visually. 
This is why we must test cables with a meter. My meter shows OL for this test result, OL being short for over limit. The resistance reading is so high that the meter cannot display it. I call this the fresh air result, fresh air for the break in the copper. Some meters will show the meter maximum, which will possibly be several thousand ohms. And the secret is to practice and to know your meter. Another fault that a visual inspection may not show is when the cable has been stretched, perhaps pulled with some force through conduit or holes in floor joists. Where the cable has jammed, the copper has stretched. If the copper stretches, it must become thinner at that point. If it becomes thinner, it is no longer the correct size of conductor for the job and will need replacing. Shown here, rather dramatically, is a cable that has been stretched and now has a resistance of 8 ohms, clearly making this cable not fit for intended purpose. We can measure the cables several ways. We will get different numbers and knowing what numbers to expect is halfway to being a good test engineer. Here we are testing a single conductor from one end through to the other end and this is what we will do with ring circuit testing. If only one end of each conductor is available, as in a radial circuit, then at the consumer unit end we can test two different conductors at the same time. But if we leave the other end open, we will be measuring open wiring and we will have an OL or over limit response. The test will fail because the pathway is not continuous all the way from the test meter and back to the test meter. We must connect the two remote ends together to complete the path. This is usually done with a connector block, Wagos or crocodile clips. Now the far end is connected together, the pathway is complete and we should have a reading displayed. The value of the reading, the resistance value that we should expect, can be calculated by using the resistance data in table B1 of guidance note 3. The resistance tables tell us the resistance of a 1 meter length of cable in milliohms in the case of table B1. And we can calculate the resistance of just one conductor or a pair of conductors depending on how we are testing the circuit. Note that we only use a one-way length for the cable, even if we are measuring two conductors. The table data takes account of this for us. Just measure the length one way from, for example, the consumer unit to the cooker or the shower and so on. This example, taken from table B1, shows that one metre of 1.5 mm conductor has a value of 12.1 milliohms, and a 1 meter length of 1.5 by 1 mm twin and earth is 30.2 milliohms. The table has taken account of both lengths of the cable so that we just measure one way. And to convert milliohms into ohms, divide by 1000 as in the next example. Here we have a 30 meter length of 2.5 by 1.5 twin and earth cable, and according to table B1, this will measure 19.51 milliohms for every metre length. Simply multiply the 19.51 milliohms by the 30 metres and we have an answer of 585.3 milliohms for the whole 30 metres. Now to convert this to ohms, divide by 1000 and we have 0 0.59 ohms when we round up. Does it matter that we bother to calculate what the resistance should be? Well. Yes it does. If we are inspecting an installation we need to know that the conductor resistances are about what they should be. This slide shows a real life example that I came across some years ago. A 9 kilowatt electric shower was connected to a 40 amp MCB in the consumer unit using 10 by 4 twin and earth cable. Or so it seemed. The length of the circuit was almost 50 meters and travelled from the garage into the bungalow roof it then went underneath the loft insulation to the ensuite bathroom in the extension at the opposite side of the building. Let's do the calculations. 50 metres of 10 by 4 twin and earth should give me a test result of about 0 0.32 ohms. In this badly installed example, I was getting a reading nearly three times greater than this. On investigation, the builder had cut corners to save money on cable. The 10 by 4 cable in the bathroom was only 3 metres long, just enough to reach into the loft space and disappear under the loft insulation. It was then joined, not very safely, to a length 
of 2.5 by 1.5 twin earth for well over 40 metres, a considerable financial saving on copper cable. And then, at the garage, it changed back to 10 by 4 twin earth again for the drop into the consumer unit. The builder was relying on the fact that both ends looked good and the undersized cable in the loft was covered and out of sight. A cable fire was only avoided by the fact that this was a guest bedroom, very rarely used, and then the shower was only on for perhaps five minutes at a time. With one simple resistance check, I was able to identify a problem with the cable. Looking at insulation resistance testing now, keep in mind that the high resistances are best for these tests. Millions of ohms is what we want. We should always check continuity before the insulation resistance tests. If the copper is not continuous along the whole length, then the insulation resistance test is not a valid test. Quite often, a visual check will not reveal a break in the plastic insulation, and this is one of the reasons why we test. But, if there is a break in the copper, we could only set the insulation up to the break, and this is not good enough. The wiring regulations require that we test domestic cables at 500 volts DC before connecting any appliances to the circuit, and then at 250 volts DC after connecting appliances, taking suitable precautions for appliances and equipment that might be damaged by or affect the testing. We will test at 500 volts DC between the ends of all the conductors, taking two conductors at a time. The test meter is connected at one end and the other end is left open, with no connector blocks. For single phase circuits, we will test the three combinations of line to earth, line to neutral and neutral to earth and expect a high ohms reading each time. We are looking for readings above 1 mega ohm or 1 million ohms, but with a new installation we should expect to see readings that max out the meter, 200 mega ohms with my meter, 500 mega ohms on others and even higher. Why are we testing? A cut in the plastic insulation may allow the voltage to jump from the line to the neutral, a danger to the customer and causing the protective devices to trip. The theory says that if the insulation does not fail at 500 volts, it should not fail at the normal working voltage of 230 volts. How can we tell if the cable is damaged without testing if the cables are in conduit or shrunking, or plastered into walls? We must test if we want to be certain that all is OK. The two main factors that can alter the results are the length of the conductor and the cross-sectional area or size of the conductor. A longer cable length will have a lower insulation resistance and shorter cables will have higher values. And thicker copper conductors will have a lower reading while a smaller CSA will result in a bigger insulation resistance value. But why is this? When the 500 volts is applied across the conductors, a positive and negative charge builds up in each of the conductors. But if the insulation is good, they cannot cross the barrier. The current cannot pass from line to neutral. The test measures the amount of charge on the opposite conductors, the line and neutral in this case. A shorter cable will have less charge. There is less copper to build up a charge, and the meter will see this as a higher insulation resistance value. The opposite of this is also true. A longer length of cable will allow more charge to accumulate and this will be interpreted as a lower insulation resistance value. The size or CSA of the copper conductor will also affect the readings. A smaller size conductor has less copper in it. If there is less copper, then less charge can build up in opposite cables. So a smaller CSA will result in a smaller charge being measured, hence a bigger insulation resistance reading. And a bigger cable size, a larger cross-sectional area, will permit more charge to accumulate and a lower insulation resistance reading will result. A summary then to this basic introduction. Continuity tests check that a length of copper conductor is continuous from one end to the other. Continuity is tested at around 4 volts and a low ohms reading should be expected. The actual ohms reading depends on the length of the conductor, the size or CSA, the temperature and the material it is made from. Continuity checks on domestic cables should be just a few ohms, perhaps one ohm for a socket circuit, 
3 ohms for a lighting circuit. Any reading above 5 ohms should be suspect. Insulation resistance is different. This proves that the plastic insulation around a conductor is intact, undamaged, no cuts, splits or loose wires touching parts that they should not touch. Insulation resistance is measured at 500 volts and a high reading is expected in the order of millions of ohms of resistance. Always carry out a continuity check before an insulation resistance test. If the conductor is not continuous, only part of it will be tested. Longer cables will have a lower insulation resistance reading and bigger cables will also have a lower reading. And what happens to the plastic insulation with age? Plastic insulation, and especially rubber insulation, will decay over the years. A cable that was measured at 200 mega ohms, 200 million ohms, 30 years ago, will start to return lower insulation resistance readings at successive periodic inspections. After five years, there may be little change. After 10 years, it may measure 150 mega ohms. At 30 years, it may be as low as 100 mega ohms. This is the result of insulation breakdown, allowing more and more leakage between conductors. Think of it as a dripping tap. Current is leaking away through the cables without going through the actual appliance. Thank you for watching. It really is appreciated, and we hope that you found this video useful. The more that you practice testing circuits, the easier it gets. And with time, this knowledge will be stored away in long-term memory and your understanding will improve. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.